أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد respected scholars, elders, brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن شاء الله as a continuation from the previous night's topic discussing Imam Imam Sadiq alayhi afdal salati was salam in which we began by stating that the Imam when looked at have an abundance from his life to learn from an abundance if you look at his character an abundance if you look at his knowledge an abundance if you look at how he went on to distribute the knowledge of Ahlul Bayt now in taking that yesterday we looked at a particular aspect of the Imam's life which was his debates, or which was some of his debates, not only himself, but also his son, Imam Al-Kadhim, alayhi afdal salati wassalam, in which people come forth and ask them what, and definitively, what is predestination, what is free will? We discussed that yesterday, and we delved very briefly on the aspect of the two extremes, which was predestinations and free will, and what the school of, school of thought of Ahl al-Bayt says about it, or the Ja'fari school of thought, says about it. Now tonight, inshallah, as a continuation from yesterday, a continuation in which we want to learn how to go about preaching, how to go about teaching people the school of thought of Ahl al-Bayt, how to go about distributing the knowledge of Ahl al-Bayt. Because someone may come forth and say that Imam Hassan, for example, Imam Hassan, alayhi afdal salati was salam, in his time, people said that he didn't go out. He didn't go and fight the oppressors of his time. Some people come forth and say, why didn't Imam Hussein do that? Some people say Imam al-Sadiq also had oppressors. Each and every single one of our Imams had different factors in which they had to either stand for the message of Islam or they saw fit that it will benefit Islam, the particular act that they did in their time. Imam al-Hassan saw that war wasn't very permissible because he's, he saw it in himself that when he went out to war, that his own general stabbed him in the leg. Every single person that he thought that was a friend became an enemy through means of what? Through means of the money of Muawiyah. Therefore, Imam Hassan, we analyzed that Imam Hassan, if he was given the position of Imam Hussein, everything was flipped around. Imam Hussein was at the time of Imam Hassan. Our jurists and our theologians come forth and state, if Imam Hussein was in the time of Imam Hassan, he would have acted in the same manner. If Imam Hassan was in the time of Imam Hussein, he, was, he would have acted in the same manner. They are, they are from one light. They are from one message. To protect the message, each and every era, each and every timeline has a particular way the hujjah of the time must act. That's why when we analyze nowadays in the 12th Imam, Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman we look at it, why is it that Imam is in Ghaybah? And this is something we need to research as time goes past. But the analogy is what? That Imam Sadiq, the one that we commemorate tonight, we want to analyze from his life. Because someone may come forth and say, well, Imam Hussein was mentioned year in and year out. And there's so much emphasis put into Imam Hussein. Yes, we said yesterday, every land is Karbala, every day is Ashura. But let's look at the aspect of Imam al-Sadiq. How does the Imam, Imam al-Sadiq apply to our life? Imam al-Hussein without a shadow of doubt. Every single Imam applies to our life. How can we look at the teachings of Imam Sadiq and apply it to our life nowadays? Because someone can, comes and says Imam al-Hussein, because it was warfare, because he had to stand against the oppressors of his time, that's why he acted in that manner. Some people come forth and say, well, the warfare is not in the modern say, society, as in it's not in the, in the first world countries, such as the, the land we're living here, such as the European countries. Therefore, let's look at Imam al-Sadiq's life. If some people come forth and say Imam al-Hussein doesn't apply nowadays because it's not war. 
Let's look at Imam al-Sadiq, even though Imam Hussein does apply. But you can always give them another example, because we have 12 lights to look at, 14 ma'sumin to look at. Imam al-Sadiq, what did he do in his time? People would come from all across the lands to come towards Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq. To what? To look at his knowledge, to look at his debates, to look at what Allah's vision is on this earth. And Imam, we want to learn from tonight the ethics, the morality, and the way we can distribute the message of Ahlul Bayt. Let's look at it in this perspective. Number one, we want to look at it in two different perspectives. One, how can we verbally distribute the message of Islam? How can we verbally distribute the knowledge of Ahlul Bayt? And how can we non-verbally distribute the message of Ahlul Bayt? Because there's two different faculties. When we look at the study of communication, the leading scientists of the time, they say most of the communication is non-verbal. Up to 70% of communication is non-verbal. That's why the first instances are very important. When someone looks at you and you're being, you're smiling, you're very polite, you're very helpful, that in itself is communication. You might not look at it that I haven't said anything or acted in a particular manner, but inshallah we'll get, it in, get to it in the second part of the lecture tonight. So first and foremost, the verbal section. We look at the imams because how did they distribute? Imam al-Sadiq when they come towards his university and they say 4,000 people studied under Imam al-Sadiq. Yet not even once Imam al-Sadiq is mentioned in the greatest books of Sahih. Even though that person studied under the people that studied under that person. Let's not look get into too much detail. But let's remember that Imam al-Sadiq was the teacher of every other school of thought that is now excelled around the world. And most of the Muslims have gone towards. Imam al-Sadiq was the original teacher of those people. And we look at particular debates that Imam al-Sadiq had with these people that went and started their own school of theology and school of jurisprudence. Now number one, we want to look at the morality of Ahlul Bayt and how we can learn from it and apply it. We want to look at the knowledge of Ahlul Bayt, how to learn from it, how to apply it. And the final aspect we want to learn in the verbal section is the patience of Ahlul Bayt, how to learn from it and how to apply it. And then to conclude, we'll look at the non-verbal aspect and how we can take from the Ahlul Bayt. So first and foremost, when we look at the knowledge of Ahlul Bayt, we know, and Imam al-Sadiq says this, the person that we commemorate, he says, there is no knowledge found on this earth. There is not a rock that you lift, except that the knowledge of Ahlul Bayt will be found under that rock. Instilling what? That every knowledge that we have nowadays, whether that knowledge is correct, whether those theories are correct, are from Ahlul Bayt. Those theories that are not correct, fabrications, etc. Let's look at it in that perspective. Every knowledge that we have, that has an essence, that has a reality, that is correct, comes from Ahlul Bayt. Imam Sadiq says this, and he says, all the knowledge that you do have is not even a letter, or not a complete letter of the entire alphabet. What knowledge do we have nowadays? And I, I want to give you a couple of stories from the Imams to analyze the level of knowledge that they had. And how is it that we can only hold on to these people and no one else? When we look at Imam Ali alayhi afdal salati wa salam, as the first Imam, as the beacon of knowledge, when he's approached, we've got to remember these things that we've taken 1,400 years ago, we have to apply it nowadays. I've mentioned these miracles of Imam Ali. I want to call them miracles, even though it's knowledge to us. But it's miracles if we look at Ali ibn Abi Talib. A group of monks come after the Prophet of Islam was murdered. After the martyrdom of the Prophet of Islam, a group of rabbis come towards, or monks come towards, the Khalifa of the time that stood on the chair, which was Abu Bakr. They come to him with a group, and they had a range of questions to ask the Khalifa of their time, or what they believed to be the Khalifa of the time. So they came to him, and they said, Are you... The person that's been instilled after the prophet. And he says, yes. He says, okay, then we'll ask you these set of questions. If you answer these questions, we'll submit to the religion of Islam. If you do not, we'll go our separate paths. So he says, ask. And they began to ask and ask and ask. 
And the Khalifa of the time, he said, what's the next question? What's the next question? And he did not answer one of these questions. And if anyone wants to look at these particular questions that were asked to the Khalifa, you go look at a particular series known as Al-Nibras, and you can find it on YouTube, and these questions are mentioned there. Then they go towards the outskirts of Medina. They left it. They say, what is Islam? Salman, he's. Salman Muhammad, he goes towards Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, oh, Ali, come and save the religion. He says, what's going on? He says, A, B, happened. He couldn't answer. They're going back towards where they came from. He says, bring them. They came to a conclusion. They said, if you answer again, these questions will come towards the religion of Islam. If you cannot, then you're not the correct religion. Because our religion promised us that the religion that will come at the end of time will answer these questions. And it's a massive list. I want to give you two questions that they asked. And to put it into nowadays, how little we know of the knowledge that they had. Of the knowledge that Allah has installed into the Ahlul Bayt. One of the questions Ali ibn Abi Talib was asked, and I've mentioned these before, but look at the beauty and the depth of knowledge of Ali ibn Abi Talib. One of the questions that they asked, he says, Oh Ali, how do you differentiate between the animals that give birth and the animals that lay eggs? How do you differentiate? Ali ibn Abi Talib. Nowadays, if you open up a biology book, anyone that's gone to school can, can relate to this. If you open a biology book, they will go into the root ancestor, then the divisions of the genes, then they have the whole theory of evolution, and then they study one particular animal, this particular side of the world, another animal that's very similar on another side of the world. Do they lay eggs? Which ones give birth? How can we analyze? They have each and every animal separate. Ali ibn Abi Talib, two words he said, and he, div he divides the entire chain into two separate beings. Which ones give birth? Which ones lay eggs? Ali, Ali ibn Abi Talib says back then, he says, if an animal doesn't have a physical E, if the animal doesn't have a physical E, it lays eggs. If it has a physical E, it gives birth. This was what? 1,400 years ago. Nowadays, in the 2000s, they've taken the, the word of Ali ibn Abi Talib and they've found that, yes, Ali ibn Abi Talib 1,400 years ago was correct. On another occasion, the people come forth and they ask Ali ibn Abi Talib, it says, Oh Ali, in our books it's written that there's a source of water that's not from the heavens nor the earth, not from the skies and not from the earth. Our books have told us that there's a pure source of water. Where is this water? Can you tell us, O oh, Ali ibn Abi Talib? Ali turns around and he says, I will answer you. He says the pure source of water is the sweat that drips from the horse. Scientists nowadays, I think it was 2007 that they studied this, and they found that the sweat of a horse doesn't have any sodium concentrate. What does it make it? Makes it a pure source of water. 1,400 years ago. That's the knowledge that was sent and installed in these people. In these miracles of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These mirror images of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on earth. This is, this is what Ahl al-Bayt's knowledge was comprised of. When a person comes towards Ali ibn Abi Talib, he gives him a mathematical equation. He solves it in a blink of an eye. The person asks Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says, Oh Ali, how did you solve that so quickly? Ali looks at that man. Look at the beauty of this narration. He looks at that man and says, how many fingers do you have? The man straight away, he answers, I have five fingers on one hand. He says, how do you know that? He says, well, this knowledge is known to me. I have five fingers. Ali says, that is the knowledge that Allah has installed in me. How was it evident to you that you have five fingers in that hand? The knowledge of what was and what will be is given to me like the knowledge that you have for your hands. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. On the first level, knowledge. That's Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. Let's look at the other Imams. Let's look at Imam al-Sadiq alayhi wa sallallahu wa sallam. When he has a debate with one of the people that nowadays has their own school of thought. He studied two years under the 
under the university, let's say, of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, and then he goes out and gives his own fatwas. The, the Abbasid Khalifa of the time, he, he saw an opportunity. He says, let me get this particular person by the name of Abu Hanifa. And let me get Ja'far al-Sadiq, he says. Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, he brings them both in his courtroom. And he says, why don't you have a dialogue? Why don't you have a debate? Let's see who has more knowledge. And you can see, if you read the history, how many of the Khalifas of the time, are the Abbasids, whether they're Abbasid or Umayyads, try to put the Imams in the spotlight. We'll look at the Ma'mun in the next story we'll, we'll look at. Imam al-Sadiq, he look at the beauty of the knowledge of the Imams. He looks at Abu Hanif and he says, tell me, who gave you the permission to go out and give these jurisprudential fatwas? Who told you and who gave you the permission and authority to give these rulings? And he says, I've studied enough. So look at what the Imam replies with. He doesn't humiliate him like that. He says, tell me what's your strength. What's your strength? That's what I want to tackle. Where is your greatest strength? What is your deepest knowledge and understanding? Which subject? And he says, first and foremost, he says, he goes through a long, a long list. Then he goes up and he says, well, my strength is in Tahara and Najasa. So the Imam asks him in reference to Tahara and Najasa. The question that he asks, he says, what's more impure if you think that you have the knowledge and the depth of knowledge of this particular aspect of Tahara and Najasa? Tell me what's more impure, urine or semen? He says, what's more impure? So Abu Hanifa is sitting on his chair says, of course, urine is a lot more impure than semen. He says, okay. Imam doesn't answer him. He lets him rethink his own answer, question himself within himself. He says, if urine is more impure, tell me why is it then when, when urine leaves the body, you only wash that particular body part. But when semen leaves the body, you wash your entire body. So the person's thinking to himself, how do I answer this? He says, no, 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 no. Tahara and Najas is not my strong point. He says, what is it? He says, Ibadat. Ibadat's my strong point. Through, I think, 20 odd questions, he says this. So the man, so Imam Sadiq looks at the man, he says, okay. What's more important, Salah or Siyam? So Abu Hanifa says, of course, Salah is much more important than Siyam. Imam doesn't answer him. He says, okay, if Salah is more important, why is it that when the women have their menstrual cycles for that period of the month, that they do not have to repay their Salah? They don't have to repray. However, if they miss the fasting, they have to fast again. So Abu Hanifa is thinking... What's, what's more important? He begins to question himself. He comes, he thought he had knowledge or a glimpse of knowledge. But what does he think he has in aspects of knowledge in comparison to the people that Allah has instilled knowledge in? What kind of comparison is there? When Imam Rida, alayhi afdala salatu was salam, look at the beauty of this. Al Ma'mun takes him into his courtroom. He wants, again, just like he'll. The Abbasid Khalifa before him, he tries to embarrass the Imams. He puts the Imam into perspective. He says, you know what? I'll bring forth not only one person to debate you. I'll bring forth every single religion we have. And not any normal person. The best of the best in that religion so they can debate you. So he brings him forth in his courtroom. Imam Ali Rida sits. al Ma'mun watches from the other side. And he says, begin. He says, begin your debate, begin your dialogue. Let's see the knowledge of Ahlul Bayt. Is it what they say it is? So the Christian straight away looks at the Ma'mun. And look at, look at what he says to the Ma'mun. He says, how can I have a debate with a man that has his own book and I have my own book? As in, how can I debate him from my book? I can't debate him from his book either because I don't have knowledge from his book. So then where is the debate? Where is the reference point? So Imam Rada looks at him. He says, not a problem. He says, I know your book better than you do. Let's have a dialogue with your book, with your Injil. So the person's thinking to himself, how on earth does this person know my book better than me? And the Imam puts him on show. The Imam gives him evidence and sound evidence from his books. From the Injil, story after story, analogy after analogy, anecdote after anecdote. 
And the person's thinking, every single time I come in one corner, the imam brings me back. There is not a chance that these people have, because why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the religion of Allah is not Christianity or Judaism. Because that's all impacted into one. The Quran says, Christianity is Islam. Judaism, in essence, is Islam. It's been reformed and reformed. It's the same message, but it's been corrupted throughout the times. We have these analogies that this particular religion, this is what happened to it throughout time. This is how it fell. Christianity, 300 years after what they believed Jesus, son of Mary, died. 300 years after, then they began to call him divine. Do you think after Jesus, son of Mary, they believed that he died, they straight away called him God? It was 300 odd years later that they began to call him divine. But to give us an image of what? On the first level, that the Imams had knowledge. The Imams, the morality. We know the examples of Imam Hassan. We have an example of Imam Baqir alayhi afdal salatu wasalam. When someone comes towards him in Hajj and begins to curse his mother. From the first level, he says, Are you the son of the cook? As in, there's no problem with a, with a woman cooking for her children. It's a job. It, does, it has no shame. So the imam doesn't react. The second, he begins to call her, are you the son of the badi'a? Which means what? Which means a woman has a, a long tongue. She says unmoral things. She causes trouble. So the imam, he's at the Kaaba. Look at the morality. Look at the difference between these people that Allah has chosen and any normal person. I say myself first and foremost, if someone was to call my mother that particular name, I don't know how I would react. But I can assure you, I would not react like the Imams would. That's, with, that's not even thinking about it. The Imam, what does he say? He says, we're at the, we're at the, house, we're at the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If what you say is true, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to, to forgive her. But if what information has reached you is untrue, I ask Allah to forgive you. What morality do we find nowadays in that particular aspect? Do we apply it to ourselves? Someone looks at us in a different manner, whether it be at school, universities, college, looks at us in a wrong way. Ya Allah, all the boys are in speed dial. All the boys are in speed dial. Come, let's have a fight outside. And that's the message of Islam. Why do we sink to that level? Would our imams do that? That's what we have to question ourselves. That something beautiful that the Christians have, they used to give out... I think about 10 years ago, wristbands that would write on it, what would Jesus do? Let's take that. Why don't we have something like that? What would Imam Mahdi Ajlallah Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif do if he was in our position? What would Abu Fadl al-Abbas having an analogy or an example of the best companion on the 10th of Muharram? What would he do if he was in our state? Would he use his mannerisms and morals and the teachings from the Holy Quran? Or would he sink down to the level that they and the shaitan wants them to sink in? That's what we have to look at. So on the first level, the way we go about, inshallah, I might have to conclude it tomorrow with the non-verbal aspect. But let's put the verbal aspect to a conclusive state tonight. Someone may come forth and ask, in the time that we have nowadays, because of the capacity, the technology, the advancements we have nowadays that we didn't have 10, 20, 30 years ago. What is our role as the followers of the Ahlul Bayt? What can we do to best distribute, to acknowledge the life, the teachings, the knowledge of Ahlul Bayt? And I told you from now, it's limitless what we can do. We have the internet, we have social media, we have our friends and families. We have every single aspect that we need to distribute this. However, many people may come forth and use it in an indirect manner or an immoral manner. We find people come forth and they attack different people. However, the Imams we saw, the Imams teach us that use morality always have the Qur'an and the Ahlul Bayt as a reference point. Because you have to hold on to them too, as the Prophet said. Use that as a reference point. 
We don't need to sink to the level of other people. When other schools come forth and they attack Ahlul Bayt, when they attack our jurisprudence and theology, we don't have to do that. When you attack, it's either one of two. You're defending or that you're too weak to defend yourself. We're not weak. Our madhab is not weak. Our madhab has been attacked since the start. Until now, back in the days when you used to cut off their hands and their legs to visit the grave of Abu Abdullah. Did it stop them back then? Why do they think that it will stop us now? The shaheed has a rank that no one knows of. The followers of Ahl al-Bayt, they crave shahada. They crave to look at the face of Abu Abdullah, the nur of Abu Abdullah. When the narrations that we have says that people will forget that there is Hur al-Ain in the Day of Judgment because they'll be mesmerized by the beauty and the illumination and the nur of the face of Abba Abdullah al Hussein. Sallu ala Muhammad. That's the aspect that we have. But let's look at it nowadays. Let's, on, on a very social level, look at how Arabs are being portrayed. Because there's one thing as the media, yes, it has a very negative distribution of Muslims in general. But let's look at it on a social level. Let's look at nowadays, on a very, very social level. Let's say someone wants to go out and buy a car. That's a very honesty, and I don't mean to offend anyone in saying this, but it's the reality. If someone wants to go out nowadays and want to buy a car, tell me, is it true or is it not true? That when we go look for cars, we look at the more Australian areas. If you find the cars to be in Arab-originated areas, or heavily populated Arab areas, we try to stay away from it. Why? Have we ever asked ourselves, we think to ourselves, no, that's a Muslim name, or that's an Arab name. There's something dodgy maybe in the kilometers. Maybe there's something dodgy with the engine. Maybe something doesn't sound right, it looks too clean. It's a reality. Some of us might find it funny, yes, it's, it is funny when you first look at it, but on the second level, we think to ourselves, what has drawn us to that level? When the Prophet of Islam came, when he reformed, we were the cradle in which the Europeans and everyone outside the Middle East was living in the Dark Ages. We had the Golden Eras. People would come all across the world to come and gain knowledge from Imam Sadiq alayhi afdal salati was salam. Number one, it's because on the first level that we have this knowledge, we have the examples, we have the Ahlul Bayt, we have every single tool necessary to achieve greatness. However, we've neglected it. We haven't used it to the full capacity because we're too intertwined with the social media, we're too intertwined with what the media wants us to be, what the media wants us to achieve, what social circles wants us to be like, who to be like, who to follow. And we've forgotten what Allah has told us to be like. We've forgotten what Allah wants us to be, wants us to do, wants us to achieve. We've forgotten that the Imam is between us. We've forgotten that the Imam looks at our a'mal every Friday. We've forgotten all this. But if we do remember this, look at how pro prosperous we will be. If we apply this to our lives, it's our social circles. Look how the Imam, he says it himself. If you just, he says, if you just do that which is halal and leave that which is haram, don't have to come towards me, the Imam says. You don't have to pray excessively and do dua excessively and do worship excessively for, me, for you to come towards me. He says, do what Allah has told you. I will come to you. Stay away from haram. Do what is halal. I will come towards you. That's what the Imam teaches us. Yet we find it so hard. And it is a difficult set, especially in the West. That's why we are rewarded in excess. It's multiplied. And inshallah, tomorrow we want to look at the non-verbal aspect. Tomorrow we want to look at how we can achieve closeness towards our imam. How to follow in the footsteps of the imam without verbally going about and teaching the teachings 
or teaching the knowledge or distributing the knowledge, how we can gain people towards the message of Islam without even uttering a word by our mannerisms, the way we move, walk, smile, act. And inshallah, we'll discuss it tomorrow. But for now, we want to conclude by praying to Allah that he allows us to understand the message of Islam, allows us to understand what the Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman wants from us, allows us to understand what our goal should be, allows us to understand what steps to take to achieve closeness towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bibarakatil Surah Al-Mubarakat Al-Fatiha Tasbiqaha Three of your loudest salawat Ala Muhammad Wa Ali Muhammad